greatest hope for Africa is the coming of Jesus Christ. He is the one that can solve the problems of our world. Have you been blessed by these services so far? You know, the music is so inspiring, so uplifting. And I was so impressed and inspired with the children who sang today to think that these children at a very young age are learning to be witnesses for Christ. They're saturating their minds with the Bible. They're learning the songs of heaven. They're developing a spiritual appetite for the things of God. So I'd like to commend the children's leadership for really uh, impressing the children's minds with the importance of the Word of God. We have been getting reports from throughout the continent of Africa, reports from Uganda of what God is doing there. The president of our work with Uganda is with us today. We thank you for joining us. And he told me this morning, just before coming on the platform, of the many baptisms that were taking place in Uganda. How'd you like to unite you, to greet Uganda? Just wave your hands to greet Uganda. Mr. President, these folk here are greeting your people today. And uh, Tanzania, didn't you enjoy the choir from Tanzania today? I will tell you, they, they blessed my heart, uh, that choir from Tanzania. Every one of the choirs has blessed our heart. And folk from Rwanda getting reports from there, little villages, how God is working. And uh, the Democratic Republic of Congo, God is moving there in a very, very powerful way. And of course, throughout East and West Kenya, we see God working. Somalia and Sudan, Burundi. You know, we're translating into six different languages. And I just want to pay special tribute to our translators. You know, when Pastor Mark speaks fast, it was funny because I was meeting with the translators just uh, a few days ago. We meet and pray each day. And I said to them, you know, when I was very young, I used to speak really fast because they said, Pastor Mark, slow down a little bit because simultaneous translation is a little more challenging than having somebody stand by your side. And I say, you know, I'm 78 years old, so I have slowed down. You should have seen me 50 years ago when I spoke fast. But translators, thank you so much. God is using you. You know, we have a special group of people here today. We call them those with possibility ministries. Some of them are hard of hearing. Some of them have difficulties, about 20 of them. Would you stand, those of you in our possibility ministries? Just stand up. We want to greet you in a very, very, very special way. Thank you for joining us. We know that through the sign language and interpretation, God is going to bless your hearts. Thank you very much. Greet those folk here. Just wave your hands. They may not hear you, but they can see you. Praise God for you. We're so thankful for you. You know, just um, last evening, in fact, uh, both in Uganda and Tanzania, we had baptisms for our Possibility Ministries group, 20 or 24 in one place and 20-some-odd in another place. And so God's message gets home to men and women, boys and girls, in every culture, with every uh, avenue possible. Let's pray as we open the Word of God. I want to speak to you on, in the light of the coming of Christ, how then shall we live? Let's pray. Father in heaven, we live on the edge of eternity. That can happen in one of two ways. Either we live to see Jesus coming, or we die before he comes, and the next thing we know is his return. Life is so uncertain. It's here today, gone tomorrow. How then shall we live knowing that Christ is coming? I pray you that every single one of us today 
would have that sense of the return of Jesus. And we would live in our lives in expectation, anticipation, and joy of his return. We pray that in Christ's name, amen. In the early part of the 20th century, this world experienced the first world war in history. In 1915, the British boat, the HMS Lusitania, was taking its journey from England to the continent. And the German embassy had signaled a warning that a German U-2 boat was going to torpedo the Lusitania. The British had placed a blockade on Germany, keeping food supplies from coming in. There was a very famous and very wealthy British man by the name of Lord Carnarvon and Lord Duveen. Lord Duveen, this very wealthy British man, had a had an art specialist, a man that worked for him, that he wanted to go and examine some of that pottery and some very famous pottery there on the continent. But when he heard the warning from the German embassy that the boat that this young pottery specialist would be traveling on might be torpedoed, he would wanted to cancel the tickets. So he met with this young man, the pottery specialist, and he said, look, I'm going to cancel your ticket because the boat may be torpedoed. The young man said this. He said, don't worry about that because I heard the warnings too. And I've been preparing. Every day I got into the bathtub and I sat there in ice water. First, I could only stand the ice water that I immersed myself in for two minutes. But this morning, I sat in a tub of ice water for two hours because I thought that if the boat is torpedoed and I am thrust into the chilly waters of the Atlantic that are so cold, I better prepare myself. He boarded the boat. As it was, the boat was torpedoed. 1,198 people were killed instantly. 716 people were thrown into the water. This young man was thrown into the water. And because he prepared, he survived for, for five hours in the icy, cold waters of the Atlantic. He had heeded the warning. This story has special significance for Christians and specifically Seventh-day Adventists living on the edge of eternity. The signs of the times provide for us a warning to prepare for the events that are soon to come upon our world. How then shall we live? How then shall we prepare for an event that is going to take the world by overwhelming surprise? In Matthew chapter 24, Jesus outlines the signs of his soon return. Famines, earthquakes, fires, floods, war, turmoil, conflict on every hand. But then Jesus ends that chapter with instruction for an end time people of how to prepare for the coming of Christ. In Matthew 24, verse 33, we read these words. Jesus said this, Matthew 24, verse 33, so you also, when you see all these things, all what things? Famines, earthquakes, fires, floods, wars, rumors of wars, 
rising crime and violence. Jesus said, when you see all these things, know that it or he is near at the very doors. Now Jesus does not say, when you see these things, he's going to come in five years or ten years. I warn you this morning against anyone who sets a specific time for Jesus' coming. There are those people who today are saying, oh, Christ may come in this date or that date. The Bible says, when you see these things, know not that he is here, but he is what? He is what, everybody? Near, even at the doors. In other words, Jesus gave signs that provide a general outline of events, but not a specific time. Matthew chapter 24 ends with two powerful parables. We turn to Matthew 24, verse 42 to 44. Jesus' concern is not that we know the exact time. Jesus' concern is that we be prepared for his coming when he comes. He gives general outlines. We can know that we are living in the time of the end. We cannot know the exact date of the end. So Jesus says, Matthew 24, verse 42 and onward, Watch, therefore, for you do not know what hour your Lord is coming. Do you believe the words of Jesus? Do you believe the words of Jesus? Yes. You're not sure. Do you believe the words of Jesus? Yes. What does Jesus say? Watch, therefore, why? You don't know what hour your Lord is coming. So when somebody says, Christ is going to come in the year 2025, 2026, 2027, what do you know? You know the words of Jesus say, watch therefore you don't know the hour, the time, the year Christ is coming. But know this, verse 43, that if the master of the house had known what hour the thief would have come, he would have watched and not allowed his house to be broken up. Therefore, be you also ready, for the Son of Man is coming in an hour when you do not expect him. The point Jesus is making is very straightforward. The coming of Christ will be at a time that we least expect it. Therefore, it's necessary to be in a constant state of readiness. The final events will come so rapidly. The final events will come so quickly. The final events will come so swiftly that even the righteous will be surprised. Christ's appeal is not that we know the exact time, but that we know the one, Jesus Christ, who holds all time in his hands. Christ's appeal is not that we figure out the time on some time chart, the precise moment of his return, but it's that in our hearts we'll be totally committed to him. Now this leads us to a vital question. And here's the question, how then shall we live? What instruction does Jesus give us in his word in Matthew chapter 24 of being prepared for his coming? He gives us three expressions, take heed, watch and pray, and be ready. Let's study each of, each of those. Why does Jesus say take heed? Matthew chapter 24 and verse 3. What does this have to do with 21st century living, with people living in major cities in Africa? Cities like Dar es Salaam, cities like Bujumbura, cities like Nairobi, cities across Africa, towns across Africa, villages across Africa, what do the words of Christ say? Words written 2,000 years ago, but words written with meaning to us today. Words that speak to our hearts today. Let's look at this first expression. Let's discover together this morning, as we open the Word of God, how then 
shall we live. Matthew 24, we start with verse 3. Now as he sat on the Mount of Olives, the disciples came to him privately saying, tell us, when shall these things be? What shall be the sign of your coming and of the end of the age? Now it's interesting that the first sign that Jesus gives is the first admonition of how to be ready. He says, take heed that no one deceive you. For many, this is verse four and five, for many will come in my name saying I am Christ and will deceive many. He then says in verse 24, for false Christs and false prophets shall arise. Show signs and wonders so as to deceive, if possible, the very elect. So the first admonition that Jesus gives is this, take heed. Watch carefully that you be not deceived. What is it that's going to keep us in the last days of earth's history from being deceived? What does it mean to take heed? It means to be alert. In the context of this passage, Christ is speaking to believers. He is saying the possibility of your being deceived is great. His church in the last days is given a solemn warning that the deceptions of Satan will be so cunning, they'll be so deceptive, that unless we are anchored in the truth of God's word, we too are likely to be deceived. The critical need for this hour of verse history is men and women totally committed to Christ, totally filled by the Holy Spirit, whose minds are saturated with the word of God. This is no time for a complacent, lackadaisical Laodicean experience. Beware, Jesus said, lest you be deceived. Keep your minds and hearts anchored in the word of God. Is the word of God your daily study? Is your mind filled with the divine truths of God's word? Do you have a regular time every day when you are pouring over the word of God? Somebody says, well, I'll never be deceived. You know what that kind of reminds me of? It reminds me of orange picking. You say, Pastor, orange picking, what's that about? You know, in the state of Florida, in the United States, they have thousands and thousands of orange trees. And these oranges hang out in the hot sun. So they have to send the pickers out to pick the oranges. And they pick these oranges. Some of them are large and juicy oranges, just like the ones in Africa. Some of them are medium size, and some of them are very small. And they've got to sort the oranges. You know how they sort the oranges? They pick these oranges and take them into an air-conditioned warehouse. They put the oranges on a, on a conveyor belt. So you have all the oranges together, and they're bouncing along on this conveyor belt. Now let's suppose that I was an orange. Well, it's a lot better to be in that air-conditioned warehouse, isn't it? It's a lot better than being out there in the orange tree. So they've got the big oranges, the medium-sized ones, and the little ones. They're all on this conveyor belt. And as they go along, they come to a set of holes. The holes are big enough to let the small oranges through, but not big enough to let the medium or the big ones through. So they come on this conveyor belt, and they come to these holes, and all the small oranges fall through. Boom, boom, boom. Then they come a little further, and there are holes big enough to let the medium oranges through, but not big enough to let the big ones through. So the mediums wouldn't go through. Now, if I were an orange and I could think, I would be thinking, those poor little guys, they all fell through over there. They're going to be orange juice, not me. Then I'd come to the medium ones. There they go. But I'm a big orange. I am such a big orange, I'm not going to go through. But what do you know? 
around the corner, there are what? There are some holes, right? And what's going to happen to those big oranges? Are they going to go through? They're going through too. Look, unless our minds are saturated with the Word of God, you see, the truth of the matter is, I am not strong enough to stand in my own strength. There is a crisis that is coming upon this world that is so great that no man or no woman can stand without the Holy Spirit impressing the truths of God upon their mind to strengthen them for the crisis. In the book, The Great Controversy, I read this statement. The book, Great Controversy, if you don't have a copy of that book, every night we're giving out a copy of Great Controversy to our guests and visitors here. It's a book that talks about end time events, and here's what it says. None. What does the word none mean? What does that mean? No one. None but those who fortified their mind with the truths of the Bible will stand through the last great conflict. Only those who've been diligent students of Scripture, who have received the love of truth, will be shielded from the powerful delusion that takes the world captive. There is a powerful delusion that's coming, but you and I need not be deceived. Jesus says, take heed. Jesus says, be alert. Our spiritual experience is strengthened every day as we read God's word. We are victorious over the temptations of Satan as we saturate our mind with God's word. We're drawn closer to Christ as we fill our mind with God's word. The Apostle Peter puts it this way. If you have your Bible, please take it and turn to 2 Peter chapter 1, verse 4. The Word of God sustains us. The Word of God strengthens us. The Word of God supports us. The Word of God satisfies us. The Word of God secures us. 2 Peter chapter 1, verse 4. 2 Peter chapter 1, verse 4. Notice what it says. Do you have verse 4, 2 Peter 1? By which, we have been given, by which have been given to us exceeding great and precious promises, that through these you might be partakers of the divine nature, having escaped the corruption that is in the world through lust. Now notice what Scripture says. It says that we've been given promises. What kind of promises? precious promises. What kind of promises? Great and precious promises. What kind of promises? Exceeding great and precious promises. As we read the promises of God, as we saturate our minds with the truths of God, what happens? We become partakers of the divine nature. We escape the corruption that is in the world. As we read the Word of God, as we listen to the Word of God, as others share the Word of God with us, our minds are fortified with God's Word. Our hearts are strengthened with God's Word. Our spirits are encouraged with God's Word. And we're filled with strength. And sometimes in the most difficult in the most challenging experiences of life, the Word of God strengthens us. All of us in life have others that we look up to. One of my dear friends is Robert Wong. Robert Wong now is 86 years old. I met him many years ago. I met him in the country of China the first time I visited China. I visited many times now. There are over a half a million members in China, many of them standing firm for God's word. When Robert Wong was in his early 20s, he was leaving a youth meeting, and Robert Wong was a youth leader in his local church. When he left that youth meeting, 
he was arrested by the police for what they called counter-revolutionary activities. What were those counter-revolutionary activities? He was teaching youth the word of God. He was teaching youth to memorize the word of God. He was taken to prison. He did not know at that time what his sentence would be. He didn't know what the charges against him was. He didn't know that he would spend 12 long years in prison. The first four years he, was sp he spent in a cell that was about two meters wide and four meters long. He was with, in that cell with three other men. The next four years he spent in solitary confinement. That means he was alone in a dark dungeon beneath the earth with no light. The next four years he was sent into exile. He told me, he said, Pastor Mark, when I went into prison at first, I came into my cell. There were three men there. All their heads were shaven, bald, but I had a full head of hair. I was young. And the other three prisoners said to me, it's good news they didn't shave your head because when they shave your head, you're going to be here for a long time. A month went by, they didn't shave his head. Two months went by, they didn't shave his head. Three months went by, it was December. December 25th, Christmas Day. They called him from the prison cell. His friend said, I bet they're going to let you go. You're going to go free today. They brought him to the barber's chair on Christmas Day. And he said, Pastor Mark, I sat in the barber's chair and they shaved my head. When I get up out of the barber's chair, I remembered this is Christmas Day. When the world celebrates the birth of Christ. Now we know Jesus wasn't born on that day. But he said, look, I got up out of my chair and I looked at the hair on the floor and I said, Jesus, I have nothing to give you today, but I give you my hair. I give you my life. Four years there in that prison cell. Every day, they would let them out a little bit out into the prison yard. And he said, I longed for the Bible. I longed for the Word of God. I longed to receive a copy of Scripture. Once a month, he could write 30 Chinese characters to his mother. And the officials let the parents or the mother send in a parcel. And in that parcel, they could have some flour, maybe some eggs, maybe something for the one that was in prison. And uh, those parcels had to be examined when they came in. 30 Chinese characters could be written. And they might send him in a pencil, a little notebook, but something. He was praying, God, oh, I wish I had a Bible. I wish I had a Bible. And one day, he was in the prison yard. Now, no prisoner had a name. They took away the names from the prisoner. So no prisoner had a name. And he heard one of the guards shout out, Prisoner 121, and he'd never met that prisoner, 121, come here. And he already thought, 121, 121. Wait a minute, hymn number 121 in the Chinese hymnal is give me the Bible. So he wrote to his mama, Mama, please send some flour. Mama, please send some eggs. And oh yes, Mama, could you send me a notebook and a pencil? But be sure the notebook has 121 pages. His mama read, the le read these, this little note. Flour, yes, eggs, yes. A notebook with 121 pages. He must be sending me a message. She began to think, 121, what does that mean, 121? 121, she, it already, already clicked in her brain. What, the number 121 is the page in the Chinese hymnal and the Chinese hymn is, give me the Bible. And she said, he wants a Bible. I've got to get a Bible to him. The Chinese government allowed them to send in soap. And they would, the mothers would make bars of soap about this long. 
send it in, and the prisoners would chop off little pieces of soap. His mother made a bar of soap. She hollowed out the inside, and she took a little New Testament, put it in a small plastic bag, stuck it in, concealed it, and hid it in a bar of soap. And she said, and then she got a notebook, counted out, because they would make the notebooks. You couldn't just go by. They'd make these notebooks. She counted out 121 pages, put the cover on, and she said, here's your notebook. Be happy with this notebook of 121 pages. And he told me, he said, Pastor Mark, all I had was the New Testament, but I cherished it. I hid it. For four years, I was in a dark dungeon. But the Bible sustained me. The Bible strengthened me. I read the promises of God. Matthew 28, 20. Lo, I'm with you always, even to the ends of the earth. Hebrews 13, 5 to 7. I'll never leave you or forsake you. Philippians chapter 4, verse 19. My God shall supply all your need. Philippians 4, verse 13, where it says... I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. Romans chapter 8 that, that talks about Christ will ne we can, neither height nor depth will separate us from the love of Christ nor tribulation. And, and Pastor Wong said, Pastor Mark, what strengthened me were the promises of the Word of God. What strengthened me were the truths of the Word of God. A crisis is to break upon this world. But we have crises in our lives today. Somebody says, I don't have to wait about the crisis in the future because I have a crisis in my life today. For every crisis, there are promises in the Word of God. For every crisis, for every challenge, for every, prom every problem, the Word of God will strengthen your life wherever you are today. Saturate your mind with the Word of God. If you've learned new truths in these meetings, step out to follow the truths of the Word of God. The Word of God is life-giving. Jesus, in Matthew chapter 24, makes three statements. How then shall we live? We shall live biblically. We shall live faithful to Scripture. We shall not follow false Christs and false prophets that lead us away from Scripture. We shall not follow false leaders that deter from Scripture. We shall not listen to voices that take us away from the Bible. How then shall we live? We shall live biblically with the Word of God filling our hearts, with the Word of God filling our minds. But then Jesus goes on in this passage. How then shall we live? Matthew chapter 24. We may not know the hour of Christ's coming, but this we do know, he will come. Matthew chapter 24, we read there verse 42. Matthew 24, verse 42. We have the second instruction from Jesus. Matthew 24, as I look at verse 42. Jesus puts it this way, watch therefore watch therefore for you do not know the hour your lord is coming but know this if the master of the house had known the hour the thief would come he would have watched not allowed his house to be broken up therefore be ready does jesus give any specific instruction about what it means to watch and be ready he does we turn over to luke Chapter 21, what does it mean to watch? To watch is to be alert. To watch is to be careful about the way you live. To watch is not to be molded by the world. To watch, Luke 21, verse 24 to 26. Luke 21, verse 24 to 26. Here we read about what it means to watch. But take heed to yourselves, lest your hearts be weighed down with carousing. Well, what's that word carousing? What's that mean? It means to be enticed by pleasure. 
So what Christ is saying to his disciples, in the light of the coming of Christ, be very alert, because the world around you is going to try to suck you into its mold. The world around you is going to shape your mind. Don't be weighed down with the excitement of the world, with the excess of the world. Don't let the world cause you to lose your true purpose in life. Then it says, don't be weighed down with drunkenness. What is this speaking about? Spiritual drunkenness, where the things of this world so impact your mind that you cannot think clearly about the things of eternity and the cares of this life. And that day come upon you unexpectedly, for it will come as a snare on all those who dwell on the face of the whole earth. It says, if you allow your mind to be saturated, not with the word of God, but with the world's entertainment, the world's pleasure, the world's excitement, the world's drunkenness to spiritual things. If you allow your mind to be saturated with that, you will fall into a snare. What is another word for a snare? A trap. So the devil is sending traps. You know, sometimes when you want to catch animals, you set a trap, don't you? But sometimes, if you really want to catch them, you set many traps. You might set a trap over here. You might set a trap over here. You might set a trap over there. Another word for a snare is a trap. Now, the picture that Jesus gives is this. The devil is setting traps for you. He'll set many traps. When he sets one trap and he doesn't get you, he's going to set another trap. To be effective, the trap must not be in plain sight. The devil never puts a sign on his traps and says, this is a trap. Some are going to be trapped by money. And they will be so enticed by money that they'll have too little time to spend in God's word. Others are going to be trapped by the world's entertainment. They're going to be so, so mesmerized, so addicted to the world's entertainment. Some are going to be trapped by pleasure. Some are going to be trapped by the world's music. Some are going to be trapped by the world's diet. Some are going to be trapped by the world's standards. Some are going to be trapped by alcohol. Some are even getting trapped by the spiritualism of devil charms. Some are going to be trapped by witch doctors. But Jesus said it well. Do not allow the devil to trap you. Take your Bible, please, and turn to 1 John chapter 2. 1 John chapter 2. How then shall we live? We shall live biblically. How then shall we live? We shall live with a sense of the presence of Christ in our life every day, not trapped by the devil's devices. 1 John chapter 2, verse 15 pleasure, this wonderful sense of pleasure. So he presses the bell, it triggers the electrode in the brain, and the monkey goes wild with pleasure. He's never been so happy in his life. The monkey does somersaults, you know. The monkey does, uh, he jumps up and down. And so they taught the monkey to press the bell. So he does, presses the bell, pleasure comes in the brain, he's jumping up and spinning around. Then they said, let's see if the pleasure he gets from that is better than food. So they put the food in. The food he likes, he doesn't touch the food. Goes to the bell, boom, 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 pleasure, pleasure in the brain. Then they put his wife in there. Will he go to his wife? Doesn't go to his wife. Doesn't go to his children. All the monkey wants is pleasure, 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 pleasure. Do you know what happened? The monkey presses that bell so much that he dies with the pleasure. You're not a monkey. I'm not a monkey. We are human beings created in the image of God. And the pleasures of this world will only lead to spiritual death. Jesus says, Romans chapter 12, verse 2. Romans 12, verse 2. How then shall we live? We shall live with our minds saturated with the word of God. We shall live not for the world's pleasures, but for Jesus Christ our Lord. 
And whatever pleasure he asks us to give up, he will give us greater joy. He will give us greater happiness. Romans chapter 12, verse 2. Do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind, it, that you may prove what is good and acceptable and fear and the perfect will of God. God's people have always faced the danger of losing their perspective. They've always faced the danger of compromising their loyalty. They've always faced the danger of a growing temptation. But yet, Christ speaks to our heart. Christ speaks to your heart just now. Have you become too busy with the things of this world to spend time in Bible study and prayer? Have you become too busy to watch and to pray? Have you thought the church has been preaching the coming of Christ for years and he hasn't come yet? Maybe he'll never come in my lifetime. Have the things of time for you crowded out the things of eternity? How then shall we live? Take heed, watch, and pray. And then Jesus gives us one more admonition. We find it in Matthew chapter 24. Matthew chapter 24. Notice in verse 28, verse 48, Matthew 24, verse 48. Who is it that says the Lord is delaying his coming? Who is it that settles down into this earth without regard for the coming of Christ? Matthew 24, verse 48. But if the evil servant says in his heart, my master is delaying his coming, begins to beat his fellow servants, that is, treat other people unjustly, eat and drink with the drunkards, that is, to live in harmony with the pleasures of this world, the master of that servant will come on a day when he's not looking for, a day at an hour that he's not aware of. Earlier, Jesus said, be ready. In other words, the admonition of Christ is this, live in the expectation of the advent. Live as if Jesus Christ were coming today. Never lose sight of the anticipation that Christ is going to come. Never lose your joy and excitement at seeing Christ coming. Never allow the things of eternity to be crowded out by the things of time. You know, one day, Pastor H.M.S. Richards of Voice of Prophecy was preaching on the signs of Christ's coming. And an old man stood up in the audience. And the guy was probably 70, 75 years old, about as old as me, you know. And he said, oh, an old man. And he said, to him, Pastor Richards, Christ may not come for a hundred years. And Richards looked at him and he said, sir, judging by your age, it's not going to be a hundred years for you. <laughs> Put your hand on your heart and you feel thump, 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 thump. It's not going to be a hundred years for you either because you can walk out of here today and have a heart attack. You see, life is fleeting. Life slips through our fingers. Life is gone so quickly. You're born you live, you die. Life goes by so fast. And Jesus says to you, to me, day by day, come to me. Day by day, come away from the noise. Day by day, come away from the crowded streets. Day by day, come. And let me speak to you in my word. Day by day, come and let me minister to your heart. Let me give you hope and courage. Day by day, fall on your knees and listen to me individually speaking to your soul. Day by day, live 
live in the light of my coming. Is there somebody here today that your devotional life has slipped? You once knew the power of Christ in the Word, but that's gone now. You may still come to church. You may still come to services, but there's something missing deep in your soul and you know it. And you cannot leave here today without making a recommitment to Christ. Is there somebody here today that you've drifted away from Christ and you sense he's calling you back? Is there somebody here today that this is your decision time? This is your moment. And you want to say, Christ, I'm coming all out for you. I want to be part of the people that are waiting for the second coming of Christ. I want to be baptized. Maybe somebody here today that was baptized, but you've drifted far away, and Jesus is calling you back. We're going to stand to pray. Would you stand with me now? And Jesus is appealing to your heart. You may be out here in the tent. Stand with us. You may be on the side here. Stand with us. You may be watching. And I have a special appeal. You may be in the tent. If you're in the tent, you can come to the front of the screen when I make my appeal. If you're here, you can come. I want to make a very specific appeal. A very specific appeal. For some Adventist Christian who knows that you're not ready for the coming of Christ, but Jesus is speaking to your heart today and you want to make a recommitment, I want you to come. Maybe you've lost your devotional life and Christ wants you to come. I want to make an appeal today for somebody who once walked with God's people. Your name still may be on the church books or may not be, but you want to make a recommitment today. I want to make a special appeal for somebody who wants to be baptized. Next Sabbath, we're going to have a wonderful baptism. If you want to be part of that, I want you to come just now. Three groups. Somebody, you don't need rebaptism, you just need recommitment. You've drifted and you need that recommitment. I'm going to invite you to come. Your devotional life has, has, has really drifted. Wherever you are, come to the screen. Somebody wants to be baptized, you come. Somebody wants to be rebaptized, you come. Brother, you come up. Make the appeal, please, to the in Swahili. Jesus, I come to Thee. Oh, Wherever you are just now, if you know that you need to be ready for the coming of Christ and something has slipped, I just want you to come just now. Just come and face me. Come and face me. Wito ni kwako, unajihisi kwamba umerudi nyuma. Mara nyingi hauna nafasi ya kusoma neno la Mungu. Ni kama ulimwacha Mungu kwa sababu ya mambo mengi ya maisha haya. Na sasa unahitaji kurudi kwake, unahitaji kujitoa kikamilifu. Naomba uje hapa mbele. Nikufanyia maombi ya pekee. Ujitoe tena kwake Mwenyezi Mungu akupe nguvu ya kufanya maridhiano naye. Wito wa pili. Kuna uwezekano ulirudi nyuma. Ukaacha imani. Ungependa tena kurudi kwake Mwenyezi Mungu. Uweze kufanyiwa ubatizo tena urudi kwa imani hii. Nafasi ndiyo hii tena kwako. Naomba usogee hapa mbele ili ni kufanyia maombi ya pekee na inawezekana ndio mara yako ya kwanza kabisa kufanya uamuzi wa kumwamini Yesu kama bwana na mwokozi wa maisha yako 
Naomba pia nawe uje hapa mbele. What does it mean to come? Je, inamaanisha nini unapoitwa kuja mbele? Let's suppose you know in your heart. Inawezekana ndani ya moyo wako unafahamu that your devotional life has slipped. Kwamba uhusiano wako na Mungu you no longer study the Bible as you once did. Umepungua kiasi ambacho haukuwa mapema. You no longer pray as you once did. You no longer pray as you might once. Umefika wakati ambapo hata maisha yako ya maombi yamepungua. But you come forward today. Lakini leo unaweza ukaja hapa mbele. Saying I want new life in Christ. Ukiomba Mungu akuwezeshe uwe na maisha na uhusiano mpya naye. His spirit will touch your heart. Roho wa Mungu ataguza moyo wako. His spirit will strengthen you. Roho wa Mungu atakuongeza nguvu. This is your moment. Huni wakati wako. This is your day. Hii ndio siku yako. To recommit. Kujitoa tena wakfu kwa. Suppose you are thinking about baptism. Labda unafikiria juu ya ubatizo. Christ is speaking to you today. Na Yesu anakuongelesha moyoni mwako. We have no assurance for tomorrow. Huwezi kuwa na uhakika juu ya kesho. This is our day. Hii ndio siku yetu. We come today. Leo tumekuja. Maybe you once walked with God's people. Labda kuna wakati ulikuwa unatembea na watu wa Mungu pamoja. But today, lakini leo, you say Lord, I have to come back. Ndani ya moyo wako unahisi sauti kikuita nataka kurudi. Jesus is calling you. Yesu huyu anakuita. He is calling you now. Anakuita sasa. The Bible never says tomorrow is the day of salvation. Biblia haisemi kwamba kesho itakuwa bora kuliko leo. It says today is the day of salvation. Inasema leo leo hii ndio siku ya wokovu. Don't worry about your weakness. Usiwe na mashaka juu ya unyonge wako. Christ will give you strength. Yesu mwenyewe atakuwezesha. There in Uganda. Kule uliko mjini Uganda. You come today to the kwa Yesu leo hii. There in Tanzania. Kule uliko nchini Tanzania. You come today. Njoni kwake Yesu leo. In West Kenya, in East Kenya. Mahali popote uliko magharibi mwa Kenya. Mashariki mwa Kenya you come today Jo leo kwa Yesu In Burundi you come Uliko huko Burundi njo kwa Yesu There in Sudan you come Pale kule Sudan ya Kusini Wherever you are today Popote pale uliko leo Christ speaks to you Yesu anaongea na moyo wako That tugging you feel in your heart Ile sauti nyororo unayoisikia mawazoni mwako Is the Holy Spirit Ni roho wa Mungu calling you Anayekuongelesha kwa to a new experience with Christ. Many are coming here. There in the tent. Either, either come to the screen or if you can get in here, you can come. In the tent, God's calling somebody. Dani ya hema Yesu anakuita. God speaking to you in the tent. Yesu anakuongelesha yule ulia ndani ya hema. You come just now. Naomba uje sasa. We're going to pray here. Tunaunda kuwafanya maombi ya pekee. Naomba msongelee ili mpate nafasi kwa wengine ambao wanaendelea kuja. Those of you who have not come. Ninyi wale ambao hamjaje. Pray just now. Naomba ujiombe popote uliko. Ili roho wa Mungu aweze kushuka. If you're with somebody that you know should come pray for them. Kama na karibu na mmoja ambaye unaona na sita sita. Naomba umuombe aje. Soon we're going to pray. Karibuni sasa tunakaribia kuomba. Je, kuna mwingine yeyote ambaye angependa kuja? Unahisi moyoni mwako Yesu anakuita. Wengine mnaendelea kuja kutoka upande huu. Karibuni. Wengine naona wakitokeza kutoka upande wa hema. Bwana atawabariki ninyi ambao mmeamua kuja. Amen. Amen. Many are coming from the tent now. Bwana wabariki sana. Jooni ili tufanye maombi pamoja. Mungu mwenyezi ndiye anayekuita. Sikia sauti yake. Naomba uje. Naona wengine wakiendelea kutokeza kutoka eneo la hema. 
you're in the audience, you just pray. Hata huku kinyamba mko kanisani naomba waombe wengine wanaoendelea kufanya maamuzi ndani ya mawazo yao. At these moments that God touches hearts. Bana Mwenyezi Mungu aweze kukuza mioyo yao. It's hard to have room for everybody. So many are coming. Bado kuna nafasi kwa kila mmoja ambaye anataka kufanya maamuzi. Kuna nafasi naomba uje. All over Africa God is moving. Popote pale katika bara la Afrika Roho wa Mungu anaendelea kuongea na mioyo ya watu na kuwa shawishi kufanya maamuzi. What does it mean when we come forward? Je, inamaanisha nini unapojitikia wito kama huu? It does not mean there'll be no more trials. Haimaanishi kwamba hutapitia majaribu maisha. It does not mean there'll be no more difficulties. Haimaanishi kwamba hutapitia changamoto maisha. What it does mean kinachomaanisha is that we are making a choice kwamba tunafanya maamuzi a choice to be Christ man maamuzi wa kumfuata Yesu choice to be Christ woman maamuzi ya kumfuata Yesu kama mwanamke kama mwanamume we are giving Jesus permission tunampatia Yesu ruhusa ya pekee to give us strength and courage and hope ili kutupatia nguvu na kututia moyo Let's pray together. Naomba sasa tuweze kuomba kwa pamoja. Those of you watching online, wale ambao mnatazama kwa njia zozote za runinga, watching on Hope Channel, wale utupokea kwa njia ya mtandao wa Hope Channel, listening on the radio, wale ambao wanatusikiza kwa njia ya redio, bow your heads with us. Naomba mnamishe vichwa vyetu kwa njia ya maombi. Father in heaven, the miracle working power of Christ has come down on this meeting today. We've sensed your Holy Spirit. You've been among us. You've been with us. You've seen these hundreds of men and women that have come forward at the call of Christ. You've worked in their lives and on their hearts. Father, you know each one's name. You know their background. And Lord, hold them in your arms. Whisper encouragement in their ears. Help them to know that even if they feel weak, you are strong. Many have come to be baptized or rebaptized. Father, I pray for them especially that as we have that great baptism next week, that they would walk through those waters cleansed from sin, totally Christ's. Lord, hold, sustain them, strengthen them, encourage them. Help us to know that there is hope. Hope for today with Christ living in our hearts. Hope for tomorrow with Christ guiding us in the future. And hope forever with the eternal life that Christ gives us. So tonight, wherever we are, this day, this morning, wherever we are, we give our lives to you. In Jesus name. Amen. Amen. I want to talk to those of you that have come forward. You may be seated there. I just want to say a word to you. Naomba wenz gina wote ambao hakuja mbele mweze mketi mahali popote mlipo. Jesus says this. Yesu anasema hili kwako. He says come unto me. Anasema njooni kwangu. All you who are burdened. Ninyi nyote ambao mmelemewa na mizigo mizito. And heavy laden. Na ambao mmelemewa na mizigo mizito. Jesus says I'll give you rest. Yesu Angependa kukupatia pumziko. Jesus says, Yesu anasema, if we confess our sins, ikiwa sisi wenyewe tutatubu dhambi zetu, atatusamehe. You've come today. Umekuja leo. Lay your sins here. Naomba uweze kuletea shida zako na dhambi zako. Just mentally say, I've laid my sins here. Jamani mlete dhambi zako Yesu. Mentally say I've left my left my burdens here. Bwana Yesu nimekuja jinsi nilivyo na dhambi zangu. And in your heart, na katika moyo wako. Say Jesus. Semeni Yesu. I am yours. Mimi ni wako. Can we say that together those that have come forward? Naomba tuseme pamoja tukimfuata kwa lugha ya Kiingereza. Yesu. I am yours. Let's say it together one more time. Jesus. I am yours. All together. Jesus. Amen. And amen. amen. Thank you so much. Tunaomba wakati tutakapo